Welcome to the Center for Homeland Defense and Security Master's Thesis Series. My name is Madeline Kristoff, and I'm here with Kevin Peters, the Deputy Director for Current Intelligence at the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence and Analysis. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Madeline. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Of course. I'm so interested to hear about your topic. What did you study? So my uh, thesis topic is on the potential use of malicious artificial intelligence by cyber criminals. So kind of examining the uh, emerging AI field and the implications for where that technology is going, but then looking at how cyber criminals could leverage that technology uh, against us as a society and kind of what were the implications for Homeland Security practitioners. And when you say malicious artificial intelligence, what exactly do you mean? Sure, so artificial intelligence is a whole wide range of computer science fields that mm -hmm. deal with deep learning and machine learning. And technology really designed to do a lot of really good things. It has the potential to um, process information in new and exciting ways and really combine things uh, and speed up the way we, we process information. Um, in terms of the technology and where it's going, uh, it's, machine learning technology really benefits from large data fields. And as it's interconnected with the Internet of Things and um, pr social media, a lot of different data systems, uh, I think it was kind of interesting where that technology was going, but then looking at how an adversary would use that information and those tools potentially to target us in more effective ways, how spear phishing campaigns and other types of cyber crime that currently challenge the homeland, uh, how it's going to evolve and become more complex with the, um, and the usage of these new tools as they get developed and as they're adopted across the, the uh, commonly used in our, in our uh, society. And how did you arrive at this topic? So I think I, I showed up in, in Monterey thinking I wanted to do one thing, and, and really uh, early on a lot of my classmates were looking at things that were really today's problems, or maybe just a little bit on the horizon, but they're things that were challenging today. When I looked through kind of the library of what people had done in the past, there hadn't been an artificial intelligence uh, and kind of emerging technology thesis yet on that. So it's kind of exciting to try to, uh, as I said early on with one of my advisors, really want to ski in, uh, in, un in clean snow that no one had really gone before. And artificial intelligence and emerging technology, um, it was something I knew nothing about. I had never really un understood the concept. So it was really kind of dive into something new. And I also really want to do something that would really be something that would be lasting. And as this is a problem that hasn't arrived yet, uh, we have a time to maybe think about it and think about what we should be doing about it. And it was kind of an exciting thing to do something a little bit different than what some of my classmates were working on. So what are the strategic implications of developing artificial intelligence technology for the Homeland Security Enterprise? Yeah, I think that's a really important question in terms of how artificial intelligence is likely to be integrated in our day-to-day -day lives as the technology continues to be developed. We have some very rudimentary aspects of that in our lives right now from integrated speakers that use Alexa and Siri in our homes. But I think how that information is being collected is really kind of the beginning of where that technology is going. Um, the healthcare industry is going to be using a lot of artificial intelligence to try to develop more accurate diagnosis of, of a whole wide range of information. And our personal the fitness devices, our Apple Watches, the Fitbits, those kind of uh, devices are aggregating our personal information in a new way. Um, and really kind of looking at this, how would that information be, you know, it's going to provide a lot of really exciting new technologies. But on the flip side of that, what are the implications is kind of what I want to look at. And what I'm concerned with and what I want to kind of be moving our community in the process right now is before these technologies come online and the threat presents itself, we have the time to be working with the private industry developers and the, and the people that are developing AI safety tools to really start thinking about the, the malicious aspects of how someone could use that against us from a cyber crime perspective. Um, my thesis really focused on people motivated by profit. It didn't really take a look at uh, outside the scope of my thesis was the counterterrorism implications or other implications. And I think it's exciting from my perspective to be really looking at the crime angle. And I'm hopeful that other students will come after me and look at the other implications of how, uh, from the counterterrorism perspective or other kind of malicious actors that maybe are motivated by ideology or other things, how they could leverage the same kinds of tools uh, to carry out their, their, um, their malicious intent. And so when you say cyber crimes as it relates to artificial intelligence, can you give me some examples? Sure. I think cyber crime that exists now, and in my thesis I really looked at four kind of case studies or future scenarios of how it could be used. Um, for example, there's a lot of research on developing automated weapon systems. And the truth is that technology is kind of commercially available now. And you could build your own fully autonomous drone, and you're not too far away from being able to program it with some really sophisticated um, targeting patterns. Uh, that was one of the scenarios we looked at. Another one 
is something that when I first started doing it, it was more on the, the forefront. Now it's kind of present day. It's the, the way that artificial intelligence tools can make deep fakes, which is taking a celebrity or someone's face and putting it on another body. We've seen that from political figures, and we've seen um, Russians attempt to influence uh, a French election uh, by putting out a false video of the French president saying things that he had never actually said in hopes of uh, changing the outcome of an election. Um, another thing that I'm really concerned with that I think it'll be a, an application is spear phishing. Mm -hmm. So you already have cyber criminals able to look um, and develop really focused uh, spear phishing attacks on individuals. As artificial intelligence tools come online and you start integrating more and more of your personal data, especially as your social media and your personal information is aggregated in new ways, they're going to have really complex targeting profiles of which they can focus on going after individuals. And whether that's someone who's in a position of power, uh, in my scenarios, it was someone who had um, a financial position, so it was more of a ransom kind of piece. But there are other, other reasons to look at why you would go after those kinds of things. And so what are some, what are the takeaways that you want the Homeland Security Enterprise to learn from your research? I think one of the big takeaways I have, and in, in my research really looked at a very broad enforcing uh, crime enforcement strategies, such as intelligence-led policing or tools like CopStat that look at how you measure effectiveness of, of policing and law enforcement programs. Fundamentally, I think those programs are what we're going to need, need to use moving forward. However, we will need to adapt what and look for new indicators. What are indicators of uh, AI-enabled crime or malicious AI that's used in a crime scene or, or, or for a victim that's been, um, someone has been victimized from malicious AI? That's something that I think is gonna have to be, uh, focus our community to work more with private industry. And the relationships that we currently have, and there's a lot of really good forums with international partners uh, that do cybercrime analysis and cybercrime policing, mm -hmm. but also really looking at the development angle. So there's a lot in the AI safety community um, academics that are looking and they're trying to broaden their perspectives beyond just the traditional research communities to look at the social implications, the economic implications, and bringing in outside expertise. I think there's a real opportunity for the Homeland Security Enterprise to become part of those conversations. There was a recent conference by the, the, the Future of Life Institute in Puerto Rico where they brought in a wide range of people from across uh, the research fields and outside expertise, and there were really no Homeland Security professionals. There were some intel community people at a very high level. Um, but there really weren't, our community wasn't really represented in those conversations. And I think that's an opportunity that we can work on now. So as these tools are being developed, uh, they're, um, the designers and the researchers are taking into account really uh, equities of the Homeland Security perspective. And that's really interesting. Why do you think the Homeland Security enterprise wasn't really represented at the conferences like these? I think a lot of the challenges we have, uh, we have to be reactive to. And, and this threat that I'm talking about hasn't occurred yet. It's something that may occur in five years, it may occur in 10. The technology may never reach that point. And that's one of the challenges for departments and uh, Homeland Security leaders that have so much on their plate as it is, to take the time to think about something that, you know, when it comes along the line, it, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I think that's really kind of a nature of our community. Uh, we're dealing with what we are, we're under-resourced, understaffed, uh, and it's difficult to look at, you know, what's on the next challenge that's coming our way. And so who should we in the Homeland Security Enterprise, who should we be working with on this issue of malicious uh, artificial intelligence in the future? I think it's a wide range of, of organizations. And in my program or in my research, I looked at um, private sector partnerships. DHS Office of Intelligence Analysis has one, but there's also one that FBI has and some other communities that really look at private industry and how to bring them together. There are a wide range of challenges of building those relationships, so I really recommended leveraging existing partnerships that have already kind of paved the way to work around uh, some of the challenges of, of sharing information with private industry and academic centers. I, I think those are the first and foremost we should look at the existing relationships and see where we can focus on, on those, those relationships. For example, uh, DHS had some papers done uh, they produced a white paper with um, private industry and government experts on the potential for AI usage and how it could be used for unintended purposes and what would some indicators be. Uh, it's a good first step. And I think those are the kind of programs that we need to be encouraging our organizations to seek out and really try to um, build the trust. Fundamentally, AI technology will not be designed with the implications of Homeland Security. It'll be designed for uh, usage in products that will um, hopefully be integrated and be widely distributed and make lots of money for those companies. Uh, but we really want to start thinking about what are the implications and also kind of build that expertise uh, in our community so that when they see crime that's been enabled by artificial intelligence, they need to go back and do the forensics. They
they have the partnerships and they have the expertise to kind of do that analysis. And so if you're a leader in the Homeland Security enterprise and you're interested in learning more about both artificial intelligence or malicious right. artificial intelligence or what the future might hold, right. where could you go to look for more information? Where would you start? I think in my, uh, in my research, there were a lot of really good organizations uh, and a lot of good leading uh, academic centers. One of the big ones that I really liked was the Future of Life Institute, um, based off of a wide range of people involved there. Elon Musk is one of the big benefactors. Uh, it's run by uh, a wide range of people from across a lot of different disciplines. And, and they do a really good job, I think, of trying to lead the discussion about AI ethics, um, the development of tools and safety, and really kind of building codes of principles. They had a, a conference just here in Monterey a few years ago where they declared uh, a series of principles of how AI should be used in an ethical form. And again, their, their follow-on series was in, was in Puerto Rico, and really our enterprise wasn't represented, and we haven't been represented in those conversations. So um, I think it's, it shows that the community that is developing AI, there are a lot of people that are thinking about the implications of their technology and, and, and what are the unintended consequences and really, uh, I think we should seek out organizations like that to try to gain more of an understanding of where they're going and how we can make sure our equities and uh, our concerns are incorporated in, in the research that they're doing. And do you see any best practices that we could take into the Homeland Security Enterprise, maybe from private industry? Sure. I, I think one of the things that, that I, I looked at um, in some of the research talking about how you build cybercrime units as a, as a law enforcement community is it's challenging in getting the right people in those units. And I think some of the research showed it wasn't just bring in people that are technology natives, you know, maybe the newer generation that come up that were um, raised with technology. It really was more the, the factor that mattered was really getting people that are interested. And it really didn't matter what their backgrounds were. You could have had somebody who was on a certain kinds of investigations for a long time looking for a change, and they really had a desire to learn. And I think that's the big takeaway I would have, is building a culture that is trying to understand how this works. And it isn't just in specialized units. It's going to be across, um, across an entire department and across organizations. And that's probably true of a lot of emerging technologies. My thesis focused on artificial intelligence, but I, I believe that's probably a good practice to broadly understand other emerging technologies as well uh, and kind of where are the things we need to be aware of. But fundamentally understanding how they work to understand the vulnerabilities is going to be vital. And so how do you build an organizational culture? How could you build an organizational culture that, that provides a basis for people to learn about this? Sure. I think one of the things that... Uh, in, in kind of the research on how you, you train officers, and, and I don't have a law enforcement background, but really looking at the challenges of all the various things, that especially local law enforcement, are, are forced to be prepared and trained on. It's very tight to get any kind of new hours and curriculum into their training portfolios. So I think it, it is uh, not a one-stop process. It's a little bit of education in the beginning, a lot of continuing education, but I really think it's important to bring in out, outside expertise. You know, there are a lot of these organizations that are, are probably really open to meeting and partnering with law enforcement because fundamentally they don't want the the implications of their technology being used for criminal purposes. They want them uh, to be used for the betterment of a lot of um, society and a whole wide range of, of, of issues. So the people that are designing and researching this, for the most part, really have their hearts in the right place. And I think you could just you know, start early on, start training, and then continue education, and really building a culture of continuing learning is probably your best practice for understanding how artificial intelligence technology is developing and really where it's going. And so is there anything else that you'd like to add about the research that you did or the future steps for, f for further research? Yeah, I think one of the things that I was excited about, uh, kind of being one of the first people at our, at our center to do this, is there's a lot of untapped ground out there. Uh, mine was, was focused really on a crime motivation is why that threat actor is moving in that direction. I didn't really look at people that were motivated for other purposes. And I think the research that I started doing really could be um, focused on, okay, people who are doing it for a political motivation, and they're looking at targeting people using AI tools, um, you know, like the, like the French uh, potentially were done. That was not for a, a the, in the case of the, the Russian attempt to influence a French election, that wasn't for a financial purpose. That was fundamentally for manipulating a, a social political outcome in another country. Um, we've seen that issue emerge in our own elections in 2016 of a foreign uh, government trying to influence our elections through the use of social media. Uh, and I think that risk in itself will continue to grow. So there's a lot of really untapped area to go out in terms of how AI tools, especially as they continue to develop, could be applied to a wide range of threats that, that our community is dealing with.
And do you see any best practices with other governments or other government agencies that are um, defending themselves successfully against malicious artificial intelligence? Yeah, I think one of the challenges there is the technology is new. And in my research, I looked at a few different um, agencies or um, within uh, the United Kingdom, France, and Australia, and how they confront cybercrime in general. One of the things that's a real challenge for, the, for us is we don't have currently a cybercrime strategy. We have a new cybersecurity strategy that was recently, um, just this past two months ago, released by uh, the current administration. But it has, and it has for the first time, some focus on cybercrime. But it's very high level. Whereas other agencies like uh, Australia, they have a cybercrime reporting system that allows them to track a whole wide range of cyber crime, anything from child pornography to spear phishing to uh, any types of network intrusions, they have a way to, to measure that. And I think that's something that we lack as a community at any level that's holistic across the whole country. Uh, so that's definitely a best practice that I looked at and, and really thought about. For us to understand the problem as a whole of government is a real challenge because we don't have a whole of government way to report that kind of information. Um, so there's a lot of best practices. Also our European partners uh, are really forward on us on their cybersecurity strategies in some cases in terms of outlining uh, responsibilities and, and delineations of authorities. Um, when you look at our agencies, there's so many different people across all the different echelons of state, federal, and local governments that are looking at cyber crime. And some are very sophisticated, some are more coming along and, and developing um, their capabilities. Uh, it's uneven across the United States. So uh, that's probably a broader cyber crime, uh, cybersecurity conversation, but uh, malicious artificial intelligence, I believe eventually will fit into that conversation. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks again for the opportunity. Mm -hmm.